Ah ja. Eu. Rando. Listen. Engage. Kasafti. Henry Fioli. Represent. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, welcome to Welsh Athletics Autumn Webinar Series. I hope you're all well. I hope you're staying safe. And if you're in Wales, you're just about to come out of lockdown. In England, you just unfortunately go into lockdown, as, as Kelly is. Um, so we're here tonight um, to introduce you to someone who doesn't need any introduction, but I will try. I've known her since she was a talented uh, gobby under 20. Uh, <laughs> And a few years ago, and uh, 20 something years later, she's now triple Olympic medalist, Commonwealth Games, heptathlon champion, um, MBE, and now team leader of um, England athletics for the Commonwealth Games in 2022. Um, so the reason I've got to come on and talk to you tonight is um, just to reiterate the point that you're not necessarily the finished, finished article when, when you are a gobby 20, under 20, and uh, um, Kelly had a few holes in her game then, but she was one of the few that actually just, just made that one decision to, to knuckle down, become full-time, really work hard. So she deserves everything she's got. She deserves, she's just worked endlessly from that point until now to get everything she's achieved. So she, yeah, deserves everything she's got. And she, nothing has come, ever come easy to Kelly and she's just gone and taken it for herself. So um, without further ado, I will shut up and disappear. Um, Bit of housekeeping quickly. Any questions you've got for Kelly, just stick them in the question section. Um, any technical issues, put them in the chat and I'll try and sort that out in the background. So I'll leave you with Kelly. So I just share my screen, right? There we go. Yay! Uh, how do I get rid of this? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, let's go. So hi, everybody. Um, right. Okay. So as Finn said, I'm Kelly Southerton. Um, and I just want to talk to you about my journey um, and what I did and how I did it um, and some probably little gems along the way that actually um, helped me get to where I am right now. Um, and as Finn said, actually, nothing is easy. And I, I expect most of you on here know nothing is easy. Nothing comes just because you ask for it. Um, but it is hard work. It's making mistakes. And it's also just learning from the mistakes and not to make the same mistake twice. You'll always make mistakes. It's just as long as you don't keep repeating the same ones. And actually in sport, you see a lot of people do make mistakes and a lot of people do make the same ones because they just don't learn or they don't listen to themselves or they don't trust themselves. And one thing I just had uh, a natural ability to do was make loads of mistakes, never the same one. I mean, in life, I probably make loads of the same mistakes, but in athletics and sport, I never did. So like my history, um, so I was um, very much an active multi-sport athlete up until I was 21. So I played county netball, hockey, um, to I was 16. Um, I had two years hiatus from multi-sport, so I went to a college that didn't have any netball or hockey teams. But when I went to university, I went to Borough Road, uh, which is West London Institute, which is now Brunel. And one of the things I really wanted to do was do netball. A decent level, and we had a lot of England players at um, at, at Brunel. So I just wanted to engage, make new friends, get fit in a different way. And I thought if I played netball, it's like circuit training, and uh, and I just wanted to be part of a team. So 
I maintained my netball all the way through to I was 21 until I left university and I just thought that was vitally important just just not just for me in a physical sense but a mental sense because it gave me a break from athletics um but it also put me into another sphere of friends um and took me away from athletics and studying um and I thoroughly enjoyed it and I still occasionally play netball for my friend's school team which I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed because I love being part of the team and one of the the key things I, I was doing as a, an, a young athlete is I never actually went to a junior championship. I never went to a Europeans. I never went to a world uh, junior championships or youth championships or youth Olymp Olympics or world schools. I just was never good enough. I was always around, you know, like second or third in the country, but that, at, that standard I just didn't have. Um, I like I won English schools a couple of times in heptathlon and I did triple jump, 300, long jump at the individual English schools, but I never actually broke through onto a, onto a team, um, which now, if you're told you don't make a team, you're told you're never going to make it. Um, so I had a couple of years where I was probably a little bit disillusioned, uh, I can't lie, and I thought, what do I really need to do to be better? And it just happened that I was at our national multi-event championships in Bedford and there was a, a coach called Trevor Marseille who picked me up. I, I was a bit lost, I performed okay, uh, but he could see I had some talent. And that was back in, uh, I was only 20, 19, 20, it's my first year at uni. And anybody who um, has experience of going to university would understand that the first year is always a bit wild. You, you're learning about yourself, you're growing up into becoming an adult. So I had a bit of a wild time in my first year, but I still train, still, I absolutely love training. So Trevor picked me up and he started to take charge of my programming. And it was, um, it was brilliant. He showed me things that I needed to do. I needed to get faster because I, I had no speed at all, but I could jump, uh, I could run an 800. So he, he just taught me how to be quicker. And I went from that year from scoring 4,900 to scoring just under 5,600 points the following year. And that actually got me to go qualify for the under 23 championships, um, which was brilliant. So I actually knew if I made some small changes, big things could happen. And I went to the European under 23s and came 10th. Um, and in those days, there was no funding whatsoever. So it was all about making your own way, never relying on anything. Um, at that time, British Athletics had... Um, had some kind of support with some medical but it was like oh we'll give you 300 pounds and that was really it so um that just supported any kind of um travel to see the physio and i was in london um and that's all really um but after that year i was still at uni i had a, an unfortunate accident in a student bar, student bar i got dropped on the floor of my knee by a rugby player who picked me up <laughs> And um, I hurt my knee. So going into 1998, I had big ambitions of going to the uh, Commonwealth Games. And unfortunately, I, di I didn't because I had a knee injury that I couldn't overcome. And after having such a successful 1997, my first year, as an un second year as an under 23, uh, the following year was such a disappointment. Um, and I really didn't know what to do or how to do it. And in those days, and I suppose nowadays, it's still the same in some respect I was left on my own to deal with an injury that I didn't really know what to do and I had to wait for an NHS knee operation I waited five months uh, I got it it was just a bone spur scrape I had that done it was very good and successful but what it didn't give me is I didn't know really what to do afterwards so I just finished university and the, my coach Trevor lived in Birmingham so I made a decision to move to Birmingham um, got myself a job working in uh, a bar on the main strip in Birmingham called Broad Street so I so I could support myself so I was working about 50 hours a week in a bar and training four or five times a week and by 2001 2002 I've been doing this for a few years and realized actually nothing I wasn't performing any better I was tired um, because I was working um, I was probably not wanting it too much but I just wasn't doing the right thing and we were doing repeating the same tra training uh, year in year out and your body gets used to that repetitiveness and it doesn't improve after a year so you need to make those small significant changes in your training to, to keep improving. 
And then um, in 2002, we um, decided to change some little bits of our training. And I actually had a great year. I was injury free and I actually qualified for my first major championship, which was the Commonwealth Games in Manchester for England. Um, I had big hopes of coming in the top three and uh, I came seventh because my javelin was very, 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 very bad, um, as it always has been, to be honest. Um, <laughs> But what it gave me is it gave me like a stepping stone and a platform. So this is what I really want to do, but how do I do it? And even though I was disappointed with that performance, I, uh, I knew that I needed to make some significant changes in my training if I really wanted to make the next level up, which was to go and represent Great Britain in other championships like the World, Europeans and the Olympics. So after that season of 2002 and my first taste of being at a multi-sport championships, which I hope maybe some of you may be going to in Birmingham in 22 or 26, um, me and my coach had spoken to the technical lead at British Athletics at the time, which was Charles Ann Comino, and he told us what we really needed to do. Um, so we went away, we worked on it really hard. Um, I made an investment to go to California for five weeks and train with Dean Macy, who had come forth at the previous Olympics and his coach, Greg Richards. So I took unpaid leave from my work and spent all the money I had, all my savings on giving myself the best opportunity of getting a score that would secure me some funding to get me to the Olympics. Um, luckily it paid off because that year I improved to 6,000 points. I scored the Olympic qualifier and it also put me on the first rung of lottery, lottery funding. Um, and that meant I could leave my job. So in October of 2003, I left my job. And um, I used to work, I went from the, the bar to working in a bank for HSBC for four years. Um, but, it, um, but having that work ethic and, you know, that, um, that ambition was really critical for me because I needed to have something else other than athletics. But that, that transition from being an under 23 to recognising that I was going to be an Olympian did take five or six years. And I think that there is a lot of pressure on young people to succeed really quickly. And my training age probably at the time was, I mean, I was 25, was probably only 19, 20. Even though I trained hard, I hadn't, I thought I trained hard, I hadn't really trained that hard. So it's just about how long does it take someone to get from junior to senior? Sometimes it can be quick. You see the Jess Nennises, you can see the Dina Asher Smiths, Adam Jamili's, they're very quick transitions and the KJTs. And then some people, they just take longer and it's just, just the way it is. And it's because you take your time to learn a skill or injuries or just probably not being in the right place at the right time with the right person to help you get there. It can be that simple, but after making, as I said, making mistakes, and failing, you learn what not to do, and then you start trying new things, and it's critical to try new things. So that's about my brief history, and obviously won an Olympic medal nine months later after quitting my job, and the rest is history, and I've got three Olympic medals, which I'm mighty proud about. So the critical thing is, is learn from having fun. Um, you know, a lot of people put an emphasis now on sport being elite from such a young level. And, you know, and that can be, that could be the right decision for them. But I do think you need to have fun doing it. You need to enjoy what you're doing. Um, I think it's pretty crucial. And as I said, I come from a multi-sport background. So diversifying what you do and how you do it, it it's not just a physical thing. It's a mental thing. Having that ability to uh, do sports but getting a benefit from it physically so netball very um, short sharp movements jumping it's endurance is an element of speed multi-directional that all added to me being a better athlete it added value in a different way um, and as I've said earlier it's also about how I felt mentally it, it took me away from athletics but I was getting a massive benefit for my athletics I think that's pretty critical um, being a multi-eventer, people think that you're never good at anything. You just, um, you jack of all trades. But actually, it's now most, especially in heptathlon, you can be very good at a, a lot of events. And I think it's specialising in everything. Not saying to yourself, well, I'm good at this and I'm not good at that, so I'll just work on this. Well, work on everything, specialise in everything. It's pretty crucial. Um, if I had my time again, I would have probably worked a little bit more on my speed earlier on and my throwing um, 
because I had some extremely bad habits going into being a senior athlete. I didn't have the basic skills to throw. Not because maybe I wasn't taught right, maybe I, maybe it was, maybe I just hadn't found the coach who took their time to really break things down. Um, so, you know, it's a lesson learned. Um, there's nothing I can do about it now. I mean, I did okay from it. So it's just specialising in everything, getting, getting robust, becoming the best all-round athlete you can be um, is, is, for me, is critical, which comes back to multi-sport. And I said, I had a dream and an ambition about what I wanted to do and what I wanted to be. And sometimes that felt that wasn't there, that wasn't, I wasn't able to, to achieve that. Um, but sometimes a door shuts in your face, you just find another door. And sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it isn't. And it's, but it's still having those dreams and those ambitions. Now, I do hear a lot that if you can dream it, you can achieve it. Well, I've, I've dreamt about winning Euro Billions every week. I still haven't achieved it. So it's about, okay, so I might not be able to reach the actual full dream, but what can I do? My, as long as I can do everything possible to try and achieve it is a satisfying thing. So it's going into, into your ambition and, and your dreams and thinking, I need to go and have no stone unturned. Knowing that you've done everything possible is really crucial just from a mental perspective. I don't think anybody in life wants to get to their old age and say, oh, oh what if I did that? If only I did this. It's just, I want to be able to take every opportunity and just smash and smash through it and know that I've done my absolute best to get to where I want it to be. What you and your learning time, everyone learns so differently. Um, people, there's some people who have that skill who can look at something, follow something, watch something, take direction and immediately learn that wasn't me um the only thing i can do that with is computer games um <laughs> i'm very good on the switch so like if someone shows me i can do it but when it came to skill or learning um how to do something it took it, it took time and I've, as i've um said about age it's how old your learning development and your training age is so when i was 25 26 training for the olympics i actually had probably the the training age of an 18 19 year old because I hadn't been training five or six days a week from the age of 13. And I, you see a lot of young athletes who think they have to train like a full-time athlete from a young age. You absolutely, you really don't. If you're really smart and your coach is really smart and your parents are really smart, you don't need to train as hard as you think you do. The, the crucial thing is learning to get skill development, get those skills, become robust in other ways and then layer on the strength and development. It takes time. And if you do it right and do it like an onion and you just layer, 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 it, it will pay you dividends in, in, in years to come. A lot of um, athletes you see will rush to learn something, rush to get faster, rush to get strong, and then probably by their mid twenties, they're injured, they have this and they have that because they haven't allowed their body to develop in the time with their skill. So it's ensuring that your body and your training fit together with your development development and training and taking your time is pretty crucial. And I'm, there also there's, I mean, some of you would see this, if you haven't made it by 23, you're too old and you never will. Absolutely hate that when people say that. It's in all sports, it's in, it happens in all wakes of life that if you haven't made it by a certain age, you'll never make it. And I was told by, um, by a coach, a, a renowned coach, by the age of 24, I hadn't made it, and you never will, so we won't support you. And quite funnily enough, three years later when he said that to me, um, I was in his training facility and I went to him, Ted, here's my medal, and he says, you've proved me wrong. I says, thank you. So he knew he was wrong. It doesn't happen for everybody, obviously, but the fact, when somebody says that you're too old at 23, it's, you're not, you're never too old at 23. There's, I didn't perform at my best until I was 31. Now that's just because maybe because I didn't have that training, that hard training in as a, as a really young athlete, but I still have major injuries and I just learned to adapt, be smarter with my training. Massive firework, sorry. Um, and sometimes you don't fit on that performance chart that says, if you're by the age of 21 and you're not performing at this level, you'll never get to here. Well, as I've said, like you learn at different rates, you perform at different rates, 
And sometimes you do need an element of luck on your side. Uh, I think we, as an athlete or coach, we've all been there where training has gone really well, but performance hasn't quite matched training. Or you actually are performing well, but the weather just goes against you or the competition isn't there. So it's sometimes things are all about, about luck. And as I said, people do learn at different rates and that is actually okay. Some people will learn a lot quicker than other people. Um, and you'll find that, like for instance, when I was at school, I was quite, I was very intelligent, but it took me longer to learn. So I was, my school was very fortunate to learn that there was, a, there was, a, there was always a group called one and a half sets, not the top set, but the one and a half sets that just took a little bit of time, a little bit longer to get to the same as the top set. And I was just one of them. I, I had the ability, I just needed just a little bit more time than everyone else. And that seemed to be the same in sport. I just took a little bit longer. And I'd rather take longer if I knew there was gonna be some kind of success at the end. And, and obviously it did. I took mad opportunities. So I mentioned that I went training to the States. Um, I took a month off work. I spent all my savings going to America for a month spent about five and a half thousand pounds to get the flight, the accommodation, the car, spending money, food. So I gambled and invested in myself. Now, not everyone has that money possible. I know that now, I know that. But I'd worked really hard to save it. And um, it then paid off because it got me the, the standard that I needed to that year before I scored 6,000 points twice. It eventually got me Olympic qualifying. So. What seemed the year before would have been crazy, a crazy decision. I thought the worst case scenario was I'm just going to be in debt. I can pay that off. I can get a job. I can do this. It's, it's actually okay. And it, you know, it could be an opportunity of going to university, going to a different university, leaving my coach and starting up with some somebody new. It could be, it could be just, just changing your spikes. It could be changing a bent. It could be just the way that you think about something or somebody or asking somebody for advice. I think having the ability to say, I'll just give it a go and see what happens, goes back to what I'm saying, leave no stone unturned. You don't want to ever ask yourself, what if, what if I've done that? And you might make an error, make a mistake, but you'll know, okay, that doesn't work for me, move on. And you do have more time than you think. Um, and one of the key things that one of my coaches has said, learn to learn to take your time at learning a skill everyone has a different way of learning it's so critical do not rush if you need to take a step back take a step back relearn it if you need to undo some learning it pays to unlearn to then learn if i'd have done that better in my javelin for instance a perfect example to go to unlearn something which is so hard to unlearn but took my time and not rushed because i had a I, I did at the time then had a, a, a quick timeline I needed to throw further I just should have invested a little bit more in unlearning something to learn something new but you know you, you sometimes you can benefit of hindsight but I just wish I'd taken my time to unlearn something so I could learn so your development as an athlete um, as a parent as a coach I think it's really important to do things outside your sport your sport you're not in your sport forever being an athlete and having other things outside your sport is critical. Like I said, I had, I had, um, I was still part of a netball team. Um, I had a work life, so I had a completely different set of friends. Um, and I think that's important, um, whether that's um, a hobby that you want to take up, a passion. I just think that helps drive your ambition in sport, and it allows you to develop and grow um, in self development. A lot of the skills that you learn in athletics and not in sport help you with life skills, learning with patience, confidence, self awareness, um, your a mental ability to adapt to stress. I think things like that that you learn in sport or learn outside sport can help. There's a massive two way communication thing there with learning life skills and learning sport and then crossing them. Patience is, is obviously, patience and confidence are two big ones. If you have the patience and the confidence in both areas of life and sport, they will help you tremendously. Um, it seems like in the last, since funding has been available to a lot of athletes, a lot of athletes now from a really young age feel it's essential to be a full-time athlete. It really isn't. There's a lot of athletes who go full-time and actually don't improve any more than they did if they just was a part-time athlete. 
the crucial thing is is being having that professional full-time mindset when you're doing your sport part-time i think if you if training is right and it's quality training you don't need to train six times a week like a professional athlete if you're still at school if you're still at college you could probably easily do four three to four sessions a week get the same quality same adaptation and the same results and actually you might be a little bit more fresher a little bit more recovered um, it gives you time away from your sport mentally and physically i think that's critical uh, too many athletes nowadays i feel are just I need to be a full-time athlete to be good. Sometimes you don't. There was a sprinter a few years ago, a lot, quite a few years ago, Joyce Mdwaka. Um, she was a part-time athlete, had done really well as a part-time athlete, then went full-time, and that she didn't improve. And she actually then decided, oh, I'm just going to go back to part-time um, athlete, work at my job, and actually she improved. She just thought what she had to do was to become a full-time athlete to be better, and sometimes you don't need to be. Um, until you absolutely have to be a full-time athlete. If you're world-class, then yes, you can. But then I would still always, always be an advocate to have something outside, to, outside your sport because you actually just don't know when that time will end. Uh, it could be very drastic and acute or you know, chronic. It could last a couple of years. But having something away from sport is really cool and crucial. Sorry, pushing on. Um, I actually can't see my slide. I'm going to move this. This goes in hand in hand with what, what I was just saying. You'll be good enough when you're good enough. Um, and that goes, you, not everyone's going to get good and not everyone's going to succeed. And that's and a lot of athletes get worried about not being good enough. But there's that's fine because it's not for everybody. And it's just knowing that as long as you do everything you can and you and you enjoy that experience, it doesn't stop you from continuing in your sports not everyone's going to make it to the olympics not everybody's going to make it to represent their country but as long as you know that you've done enough um and you've you critically you know mentally you've done enough to get where you need to be or you're happy with what you've achieved and you can't give any more um that's that's a, that's satisfying and when you're learning with your coach i i i, I think it's so important that coaches don't dominate athletes at a young age. Uh, I feel athletes should constantly challenge and ask their coaches questions, but also listen to the responses. And that's both ways. I think coaches should ask their athletes more questions. Co athletes should ask the question, why are we doing this? What's this for? So their development and their learning is enhanced. When a coach just tells an athlete what to do, it's very much we tell and you do. And the learning can probably take a little bit longer. If you have an understanding of why you're doing something, actually you can get your head around it a little bit easier. Maybe you can visualize a bit easier. And it's the same for a coach. If you have these open discussions about why you do something or discuss how you're going to um, implement certain parts of training so the athlete has a say in what they're doing, it really helps the relationship and the development of both athlete and coach. It's just how you learn, and as long as coach and athlete listen, um, it's vital. Because a lot of coaches will talk, 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 and actually they're not listening to their athlete and not watching their athlete in terms of what their body language is saying. Are they learning? They're just driving what they think they should to their athlete, and they're not actually um, get understanding what their athlete needs to do. They're just just doing what they'd always do. So. And what I mean by that, probably a bit of a confusing comment, um, is that a coach will know how to coach a certain way to a certain person, but actually everybody has a different way, different style of learning, and that's crucial for the coach to know. And sometimes you only know that from actually having those conversations with an athlete and watching their body language, listening to what they're saying, and for the coach to be able to adapt to that athlete. Um, that's pretty critical um in learning especially developing skill is everyone learns differently and as a coach you should know that right next one okay what happens if what happens if you don't make it um i've been there at the beginning i didn't make it i thought i would i wanted to go to sydney olympics in 2000 i never did i was in a pub watching it at midnight 
in the walkabout bar with a few beers and thinking I should have been there, I could have been there, um, why wasn't I there? I know, I didn't make it. And I actually then thought about how, why, am I, why do I feel so disappointed? Because I had a passion and I knew I had a, an ambition. So I go back to that ambition. I had an ambition to try and do everything I could to make it. And when you do make it, what do you do? Because that's just as scary as if you don't make it. And some people struggle with success as much as they do with failure. And at first it was overwhelming. And I can actually say when I won the Commonwealth Games, even though that was two years after winning an Olympic medal, I was so overwhelmed. I didn't enjoy it the way I should have in celebration because I thought, okay, what's next? So it was really, 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 really hard. So it's just as hard to be successful than it is to not be successful. And what happens if you get injured? What happens if I get injured? What do I do? How do I do it? most important thing is for everyone to listen to their body um listen to different things list signs it could be a tiredness it could be a stomach ache it could be just a little ache in the toe it could be a tweak in the back or your little fingernail hurts i listen to everything anytime i've coached somebody if their fingernail hurts there's something wrong so i need to then establish what that problem is and why is that is that something i'm doing is it something the athlete's doing is it something in training is it something outside training uh, and, and having a plan, pretty crucial to have a plan in anything that you do, because once you have a plan, you can then make another plan if that plan can't work. So I'm, as an athlete, as a developing and an elite athlete, I probably had probably start off with plan A and I'm probably on plan Z by the end of the year because you have to make so many adaptations. What do you do if you get beaten um, when you should have been winning? Um, that's another thing. How do you deal with that? Sometimes getting beaten is a good thing. It makes you readjust, makes you reevaluate what you're doing, how you're doing it. Um, and then in the same as when you're winning all the time, we, we, we've in, in Great Britain, we have a thing where there's a lot of junior athletes that win, 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 win. And as soon as they step it up to senior level, they get beaten and they can't deal with it. Losing is good. Losing, it, it can give you the ability to deal with stress and then how do I cope with that? Learning to lose is really good. It, it is a skill and learning to win is a skill they both are very similar as i said when you make it and you don't make it um when you win you need to learn to celebrate it so when somebody does a win could be do it getting a skill right in training a win could be anything winning a race actually getting a, um long jumping and actually getting no fouls that's a win so a win can mean anything um and it's in it's celebrating those little wins because psychologically celebrating those little wins is really is really good for development it makes you remember good things and then you can move on what was if you want to leave your coach i've gone through a few coaches in my time and, and doing it the right way is always crucial coach athlete relationships especially with young people can be really fraught when an athlete or a parent wants their athlete to leave and it's ensuring that the communication's there all way. Some, some coaches in, um, do get quite possessive about their athletes. They say they're out, that's my athlete. No one belongs to anybody, always remember that. Also, it's just being communicative. It's having that conversation at the right time, um, always face-to-face -face if possible, um, but not being afraid to, actually, I need to move on from my coach because actually I feel that I'm gonna develop somewhere else. Um, you see a lot of athletes will stay with somebody purely because they're scared to leave or they don't, the reaction of the coach might not be what they, 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 they they'll upset their coach and no coach would put that onus on an athlete to be scared to leave um, because sometimes there's some coaches that are really good at a certain level and they're great at getting athletes to here but getting to the next level, maybe not so good. So you want to move on, especially when athletes want to go to university um, and they go to a university much away from home and they want to change coaches. I have been a mentor um, on the ACE programme and there was quite a few athletes who were leaving their coach and going to university and going three or 400 miles from where they live. But their coach was adamant that they were going to still coach them from far. And I was like, it's not going to work like really isn't well i'm going to take my athlete all the way to the top i said you might do but it might be that your athlete needs to go away to university grow up and learn and then might come back or they might have you still involved the likelihood it, you won't be um 
and actually a lot of the coaches like I'll prove you wrong and actually within a year the athletes have left their coach and gone with someone else um, with the coach nearer to where they're living um, it's what happens but athletes are very scared of leaving their coaches and I think some coaches should be very open no one owns anybody and you're just you're you're basically a custodian you're just basically a custodian of a time of an athlete and you're trying to get the best out of them and if they choose to move on it you should exactly let them move on it's if they feel they need to let them it's it's their choice um what happens if you don't want to do it anymore and that's always that's also okay too there's many athletes who have done athletics all the way through their life they get to the stage when they're 18 19 20 life happens and that life could be university, it could be a job, it could be a partner, it could be travel, it could be anything. And they just don't want to do it anymore. And I, I, I think that's okay. It maybe they still love the sport and maybe they'll return, but sometimes you do need a break if you've been doing it for a long, long, long time. I, I understand that. But it is actually okay. And and it's a for parents and coaches, it's saying to the athlete, okay, well, I'm still here if you need us we'll still be here to coach you if you want to come back the door is always open and athletes if you need to go go sometimes having a break for a few months i know a few athletes who went away and came back and were still a successful a few years later they just need a time away um or they've had a real they've been a brilliant junior athlete and been a senior athlete at the same time and the pressure was too much and then as soon as they could get away from home in the terms of that pressure situation with exams and they've gone to university sport has stopped for them in terms of athletics and they've enjoyed life and that, that just happens it's just how people develop okay right so remember who we are which is crucial we all do things differently it doesn't matter who you are coaches athletes parents you all do things very differently to what other people we all have our own opinions and thoughts and that's and that's pretty standard obviously in life um and but we have to remember that and get as i said earlier in, in in the in the chat i talked about getting the basics right basics in everything so whether it's skill acquisition and learning a skill in in athletics or it's learning to communicate effectively with people around you um getting your education or your vocation in place um is crucial these are basic things to help you through life it's not just about elite being going to the olympics but actually setting yourself an, an all-round supportive network of knowing that that you, that you can take with you through your for your journey of life um when you're when you're coaching when uh sorry excuse me when you're with your coaches learn with your coaches your coaches don't know everything so they have to go away and learn how best to uh, support athletes, uh, how to develop their athletes. And it's a con coaching is always a continual learning development. You're learning new things all the time. Remember that. The better, the, when athletes learn with their coaches, you get a better relationship. And it might be that actually your relationship grows and then one day an athlete might become a coach um, and work alongside their current coach and bring other people through. Learn with your coaches, listen to your coaches. Coaches do the same. But also parents out there do actually do become coaches too. So if you if you're involved with an athlete and your child is a coach, is an athlete, you know, learning with that and what it takes to be a coach, communication, um, teaching people how to be the best versions of themselves is, is really it's actually a really good it's really good fun. What can athletes do that? What can you do to help yourself? What can you do to yourself to be better? What's how how can you be the best version of yourself so look around you so if you want to be a really great athlete athletes and you want to go to the olympics or you want to represent your country you want to work wales england or whatever what can you do for yourself that can enhance that so look at your environment uh where do you recover what do you eat be have that professional mindset in some of the things that you do because actually that gives that stands you in good stead for life anyway creating good habits for you is is good um and looking at the environment you're in being open with your with your parents or your carers um with your coaches with your friends with your family with your siblings um is will help you be uh, a more rounded athlete it gives people um 
given a, given people the um, idea of what world an athlete lives in is crucial. A lot of athletes don't necessarily speak to everybody around them in the support network. So maybe there's a crucial competition coming up and you haven't really told your friends. And next to your friends are WhatsApping you at like 11 o'clock at night or they're tagging you in an Insta story or and then you're awake, you're, you're they're distracting you from what, you know, a good night's sleep. It's like, well, if you explain to your friends and your family and everyone around you what's happening, what you what you want and what you like, they can adapt to you and support you. And I think that's pretty crucial. It's being expressive and open to the people around you. Also, be accountable for your own actions. A lot of um, people will blame other people for why they haven't performed, why they haven't succeeded. Um, and in the, small, in the small respect, there will be some times where it may be not your decision, it's someone else's decision that's affected your performance or decision. But be accountable for what you do and how you do it. Take, also, make sure you take the blame for some of the things that you do. Yes, you're coached, but also some of those decisions that you, you make in a, in a race or a competition or a jump or training is down to you. So always be accountable and don't try not to go looking for the blame anywhere else. Look within yourself. It's pretty easy to say, okay, what did I do wrong? How could I have made it better? Look for solutions within you. You'll, le you'll learn and move on so much quicker. If you play the blame game and blame everyone else but yourself, it will be so much harder for you. Um, and that's just a life skill. Or I said, what could I have done better? How could I have done it? Maybe it is someone else's fault, but actually you've been affected by that and it was your decision. And so, okay, if I had made a better decision, maybe that wouldn't have happened. So be accountable for your own action. I was so lucky when I, before I went to my first Olympics, my training partner was Denise Lewis and she was the Olympic heptathlon champion. And we had a tough coach, Charles, and he was Dutch. And um, training was, I would say, hard, um, not extremely hard. In, in some respects, people might have thought it sometimes is bullying. It, I never felt that. It was really hard. It was tough. And when the chips were down, Denise would always say to me, laugh in the face of adversity. It's all you can do. So when a situation became too unbearable and you wanted to cry, I'd laugh. And we actually put that on a whiteboard in Charles's office. So every time we would go in there and we were about to get a, you didn't run hard enough, or you should do this, we would look at the board, see that comment, that quote that Denise had put up there and just laugh because it, um, it just made us, nothing ever, ever comes easy. So um, that was one thing that um, I take with me now, just laugh in the face of adversity. If, if it gets difficult, just laugh. So I do now, so if I'm nervous or, <laughs> I'm not laughing, I'm not nervous now, but if I'm nervous or uh, um, find things difficult, I will laugh. Um, and um, that's just me because I've learned to deal with um, hard moments with, with a little bit of, um, with a little bit of a chuckle to just to otherwise I cry so uh, yes so Denise taught me just to laugh in the face of adversity it's actually it's one of my favorite sayings I don't think she came up with it but she was one who told me about it okay so oh I'm ending the slide so have I forgotten anything probably loads and loads of things um I think and then my two cats, by the way, that's my family, cat family. I did have four, but now I've got two. Um, Daisy and Colo, Colo on the floor, Daisy on the chair. Um, I think my overriding comment to anybody listening to this tonight is, it's just, you know, things aren't on a straight line. Um, things are always zigzagged. Sometimes they go down, sometimes they go back. Sometimes you do take 10 steps forward and 12 back. Um, and that's the way it is in life. And so, it, but it's also learning from the mistakes that you've made and not repeating them. So just remember, it's like if you have that ambition and goal, and you can see it, it just keep thinking. Okay, nothing. If if it comes easy, just go with it and run with the wind. If you're, it's like run, it's no different than running in a race and you've got a lovely plus two behind you on a beautiful day when it's 25 degrees and everything's perfect and the track's lovely and hot and you've got the perfect lane, the perfect race, go with it and allow that to happen um, and run as far, as hard as you can, as fast as you can until there, there is a time where you might have to take a side step or step backwards. Um, but learning to deal with them and learning that actually this is part of where I need to go. So if I need to take a step back or I need to 
something will fail. Okay, what did I learn from that? Okay, well, I remember that if that comes up again, how do I how do I maneuver around this? And just have that confidence that actually everyone who's successful, and you would have heard this a million times in a million different books, everyone who's successful would have failed somewhere. And that's pretty crucial. Okay, so that's me. Anyone's got a question to ask? Um, you might not have. Uh, I can't see any. Um, if you have got a question, you want to ask a question at any other time, please just Twitter me, at Kelly Sutherton on Twitter or Instagram. Um, I'm, very, I'm very, ask me anything you want and I'll be as honest and open with you as possible. Um, but that's me. Thank you. I'm back. Thanks very much, Kelly. I started making notes, but I think I'll just re-watch it on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> um, the nice message to finish with about uh, life isn't life and training for athletes and coaches isn't linear is it? it's not linear progression there's going to be ups and downs in everyone's life but some great messages throughout oh we've got a question have we last minute oh exciting oh brilliant thank you kelly oh thanks Ronan. that's nice <laughs> i think you said the word i can't remember linear it's, it is it is um it's like anything like sport and life they do um you, what you learn in sport and life, they coincide. Um, and it, like you say, nothing is ever like this in life. And you and anyone who knows that, you know that. And you do take the bumps in the road wherever you go. But this is how you deal with them. And actually, if you've never deal, dealt with a bump, it's really hard. So actually, the more bumps sometimes you deal with, actually, the easier they are to get over. Um, crazily, you say that, but it, 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 is, it is very much true. 100%. Right, brilliant. We won't take any more of your time, Kelly. Thank you very much. We'll get let you go watch the Arsenal. Thank you. Right, no, brilliant. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Take care. Thank Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.